today we'll start with uh, some uh, small introduction to the practical uh, assignment which you will be assigned uh, for say the next two or three weeks. Uh, so, uh, well, without further ado, let's um, uh, let's start forward. Uh, so, um, the first home assignment will be a programming one. It will be a practice in uh, Boolean logic, and there will be well a choice of two just for you to to choose. So, well, both of them are not that hard, but they will um, say show you how to use the methods we discussed in the previous lectures in practice. So all these slides will be published on the course's webpage, or well, they're actually now published on the previous edition of the course webpage, so there's no need to take pictures or uh, scan them. Also, the video will be published on uh, the whole course webpage as recorded from Zoom. I hope it will work. So um, for the first home assignment, the choice of two tasks. So first is a translation into C and DNL. This is a bit easier one. So please choose this if you are not that confident about your ability to code. And the second one is the more interesting one is the two CNF or uh, for uh, the resolution method for satisfiability of uh, two CNF. Mm. So yeah, for the people who are watching me in Zoom, please uh, write something to the chat that you hear me just for me to be a bit more confident about what's happening now. Um, so so uh, this is the short formulation of the assignment. In the end of this lecture, I will show you the um, uh, a formal official formulation, and this will be published tonight at the course of the page. So this is, for example, in task two, you will have something like a bit modified to CNF. So it could include clauses along with clauses like, I don't know, P or not Q. You could also have Q implies Q or P implies Q. So this is just syntactic sugar, but this just makes the assignment a bit more interesting. So, and now why are we talking about parsing? Because the first part of this um, uh, home assignment is to translate the um, input into a machine digestible form. So you'll be required to uh, make your program work uh, with uh, human readable input. So um, that means that uh, the input format is exactly as you would expect it in, a, in written form. So something like this, for example, P implies you should be written like that. And uh, this should be translated into a form which is readable by a machine. So something like a syntactic tree or array of clauses or something like that. So in order to do that, um, we'll need to formalize the grammar of our set of formulae and to um, use it for um, uh, parsing the input data. So here is what they usually call the vacuous nar form or call it a context-free grammar. So this is the grammar for the set of all Boolean formulae. Well, not all, we don't have a negation, for example, here, but just, well, an, an example. So uh, it's either a variable or it's disjunction or it's conjunction or it's uh, implication. And here we expect the user to put all the brackets where they should be. So there is another example. This is a grammar where the brackets are optional. So you can make just a disjunction, just a conjunction, and if you wish, you can add brackets. What is the difference? The second grammar uh, is ambiguous. So for example, if I write a formula like that, well, uh, it has two different, what they call parsing trees. So you can either say that this is a big formula which consists of this small formula, implication and this small formula, and then you parse this as formula or formula or you can just say, okay, it's a big disjunction, so this is second formula, this is the first one, and you parse this one. So this is, uh, well, this has different meanings semantically, and syntactically, this is also formally uh, different uh, because, um, well, just because that uh, if you ask the question how to parse that, so you want to obtain something like syntactic parsing tree or some other the formal representation, you won't get an answer. So should you give one of the parsing trees or maybe you should give all of them or maybe something else, maybe you should give a better one. So uh, in ambiguous grammars, you have problems with that. And uh, sometimes they, you know, they could be overrun by uh, making the grammar unambiguous. But the other way of doing this is to avoid uh, or is to uh, impose some uh, priority conditions on, on there. 
part from trees, which we'll see in the church. So this is priority and also association rules. So for example, if you, here you can say that, okay, disjunction has bigger priority than implication. This means that implication should be parsed first as the utmost one. But if you have P or Q or R, you will have to do association. For disjunction, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it is associative by itself, but for implication, it matters. What does it mean? P implies Q implies R. It's either P implies Q and that implies R, or it's P implies Q implies R. Well, the answer just in this case is that implication usually associates to the right. It's the usual uh, agreement about implication because this means that you will have many uh, premises and one conclusion. But if you do uh, associate to the left, you will have P implies Q implies R, you will have higher order implication, implication from implication. This is a more complex formula. And in this case, you should uh, explicitly state that using implication. For uh, conjunction and disjunction, it's formally irrelevant, but again, for uh, the parse, it's important because the parse on the syntactic level does not know your associativity, that it's associated. Okay, so now let's go for the parsing workflow. So this is the standard uh, usage of the parser. Mm. So how should it work? Uh, well, uh, it takes an input, which is actually a stream of symbols, of um, input tokens. So it's brackets, variables, implications, stuff like that. So just let just uh, bytes in, the, in your uh, encoding. So it goes through lexical analyzer, which uh, yields a stream of tokens. Well, what's the difference between a symbol and a token? So for example, this thing is two letters, it's two symbols. But it's more convenient for us to consider this as one token just as one lexical element. Mm -hmm. Again, so here you will have a variable which uh, is just one letter. But technically in programming languages, you are allowed to use identifiers with what are longer words. So there is a specific lexical um, description for them. So they can be words of uh, Latin letters. They can also include digits, but not as the first one. They can also include some other special symbols like underscore, for example. So a big, uh, string of uh, letters, which is the word, which is the identifier, can, be rep can rep represent just one lexical element. So this is the lexeme or the token. So the stream of tokens is passed as an input. So here this arrow goes upwards, uh, that it goes to an upper level of uh, abstraction. It goes to the syntactic analyzer or parser, and it gives us a recursive structure, well, which is usually a tree, but it also can be something else, can be a deck, for example, or something else, you recursively define your syntax. So here you uh, define the notion of formula recursively. Recall that this is the exactly the definition we started with in the first lecture. Formula is something, something, something. So it can be a variable, this is the base case, or maybe some constant, but also it can be constructed from smaller formula using inductive or recursive clauses like that. So it means that if something is a formula, then this is also a formula. So this means that we can define something on formula recursively. And the structure will be something like that. Okay, a formula can be this or this or this, and here you will refer to the uh, recursive structure for the subformula. So it's recursively defined. As usually say, when you do trees, you can define them as recursive structures. So a tree is either trivial, so it's just one leaf in which you can keep some data, for example, the name of the variable, which is here. And also uh, a tree can be, say, a root. Here, trees are usually binary, but they can be arbitrary, arbitrary. And you have the root and you say, okay, it has mm -hmm. some information inside, which for example, the name of the connective there. And then you will have references to the subtrees. And this is the recursive definition. And this recursive structure is the result of the parsing procedure. So what do you do next? It's up to you. So for example, if you are writing a compile or a programming language, then you will get this internal recursive structure of your program. And then you have to pass it to a code generator, which will generate your code in assembler or some other language. If it is an interpreter, say a calculator or something like that, you will just immediately compute this. Here you know what to do. So if it's, uh, uh, let's say, task two, when you have to apply a resolution, you, what is going to be a recursive structure? Well, it will be quite shallow. It will have only, say, two levels or three. So you will have this big uh, conjunction. It will boil up into an array, actually, of references to um, 
clauses, each clause is also an array, and the elements of this array are just literals. So you will have this convenient structure of uh, 2D uh, array of literals, which uh, will then go to your program, which you implement for using, where, where you implement uh, the resolution procedure for checking satisfiability. So lexical analysis, well, this is the input, which is a string of symbols. I may run an example of um, a C programming language, a trivial program. So the output will be something like that. So it will include keyword integer, then identify which is called main. Well, main is not an integer. So now you have the bracket, which is a specific token, the keyword void, and so, so, so. So this, this is a string of values. So here you see that this is the name of the token, this is its content. So it includes something. Okay, here it will be a string which includes like this. So tokens are much more convenient, as I said, for uh, to work with inside the grammar. So we're going to have a run an example for two days. So this will be not your assignment. Well, I will show you a different example. Of course, simplifying algebraic polynomials. So as we know, the Boolean formula are much like uh, algebraic expressions. So we'll just pass straight polynomial. And we consider the following task. We translate a polynomial into normal form. So for example, here you will have some polynomial written like that. Here the normal form is this. So you just uh, as I say, open up the brackets. But it, it, can be, it, it can be more complicated. So, for example, there could be nested brackets or something like that. So, this is. so the grammar for polynomials, so you will have a term for a term with unit and minus. This is a unit and minus, not the, this is a plus. Yep, so a term is uh, something like mono or, or in, in brackets or a term multiplied by this. So you will have, we don't have any specific notation for multiplication. So we just write it like a school without it. And what is a mon 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 monomial, so it, it can start with an optional coefficient, which should be integral. Then you will have this letter x, which is the only parameter, you will have only one argument. And then you have optional power. So the uh, coefficient is an integer, or it could be empty. Epsilon is an empty word. Inside, so it's just written in a mathematical form like that. Inside the uh, lexical analyzer, or, sorry, inside the syntactic analyzer, uh, this will be just empty, it will be nothing. But here we write epsilon just for readability. And optional power, which is the sign of power, and then it's an integer. The coefficients here are in integral, so they could not be, uh, say, real or rational, but it's also just arbitrary. And there is the input example written in this uh, syntax. So it's much like the, well, actually it is the, the same written in what they call letter. So but this is just looks, actually the same, the only difference is this, that we write it in a linear way. So that we don't have this superscript, so it's just linear inputs. And how is it implemented? So it's implemented, the lexical analyzer is implemented by a syntactic tool called lex, and the, the syntactic parser is implemented by yak. So lex is just from the word lexical, and yak is, well, it's a name of a beast, but it's also a, uh, an abbreviation for yet another compiler compiler. They call lex Lexical analyzers compiler compilers because it's a way to build a compiler for another programming language, a meta, meta software. So um, Yak has many implementations along with Lex. Uh, you are free to use any programming language you wish. In the examples here will be in Python. And there will be, so if, for example, in C or C++, this guy will be called usually Bison, mm -hmm. which is another species of wolf, it's Yak. Uh, and Lex is usually Flex. Uh, so we'll use the implementation in Python, which is called PLY, or uh, Python Lex and Yak. So uh, how does this really work? Uh, so uh, we are going to de describe our lexical, um, uh, our lexical structure along with uh, uh, the syntactic structure formally as um, this sort of grammar, so this will be incorporated in our code, but wait, this is not Python code, this is not C code, it's specific language for describing context-free grammars of backwards now forms. How do we incorporate it there? So actually, there will be a program in Python, we'll proceed to in a minute, it will be implemented like that, that after, so a name of each function in Python, you can add a string of symbols, 
which Python recognizes just as a comment. So actually ignore it. But when you will do Python like some Yak, then uh, when you in actually run it, when you instantiate it, uh, you, the, this system will uh, actually make, so this is the uh, advantage of Python being an interpretable language. So it has access to its own source code. So the program, this real white program, will look at the source code of the program itself, so make a reflexive trick, and then it will uh, actually implement the parser. So inside this course, we will not go into details how the parser is implemented, but uh, we'll believe that it will do it usually correctly, sometimes not, but we'll speak about this later. Uh, and then this parser will be implemented and put down in a file, as a, or actually in memory, as a code in Python, and then this will be invoked. And when it is invoked, then it will refer back to these functions you defined in your source code when it incurs this uh, uh, con concrete examples of this rule. So for example, if it parses and it says, that, okay, this is something like expression plus a term. So here is an expression plus term. And uh, then it will run your function, which will do your generation of your tree. So this is how it basically works. Okay, so this is, this is nice. And uh, uh, then it will just run run your functions and your top function will be, of course, started at the very end when it goes up to the building the whole tree and you will get your results. You can immediately interpret that. So for example, you can implement, instead of simplifying, you can implement just computing. You can say, okay, you will uh, ask the value for X as a parameter and it will just compute. So then you will have actually no non true Will recursive structure, your recursive call will just take the values of the subpolynomials and do the computation. Mm -hmm. So here you won't need that, you will need to do something else. You will actually, because you don't know the value for x, you will actually keep the polynomial as a, your recursive structure at each time. And uh, you can either keep it in the tree-like form and then simplify it into that, or you can do a better thing, you can just keep, uh, each time you can compute this simplified form of polynomial like an array, for example. So the code, which uh, I will just briefly discuss today, will be placed on the course's web page. For your disposal, you can read it and see the syntax in detail and stuff like that. So we presuppose that you know Python. Um, therefore, the programming part will be not that hard for you. But um, the part which contains the uh, grammatical thing will be just visible inside the code and this will be intuitively understandable. So I hope that, well, I didn't formally define the notion of what a context -free grammar is and stuff like that, but I hope that it's intuitively understandable. So the context -free grammar is just a formal representation of our recursive definitions for formula. So this, this is, you see here. So let me, before going further, let me make somewhere one more comment. So here you see we have the notion of expression, you have the notion of term, and we have the notion of monomial. So you could ask, why should we do this? Why don't we just call everything expressions and say that on expressions, we have the operations on of multiplication, uh, uh, addition and subtraction. So this is for a uh, uh, non-ambiguity of the graph. So in this form, the gram is unambiguous. This can be even formally proved. If you just say that you can allow expression plus expression, you will have these problems with associativity, which you, have, you will have to solve and all stuff like that will occur. So here we made the grammar unambiguous. But uh, Python, Lex, and Yak, and Yak in any, in any implementation can uh, also handle uh, associ association and uh, uh, priority of operations. It can be done, but here we avoid that. Also, we avoid the stuff like 2x, 3x, or something like that, just taking two monomials and multiplying. Okay. So, Lexical analysis, the lexeme. So first we declare the set of tokens mm -hmm. in an easy way. So this is just the name. Uh, the token for integer will also include a number. So it will, so this is the token. And also there are literals, these are specific, well, this is not the same as literals in wooden form, it's just name clash, it's different. So literals are specific type of tokens where first they are one symbol, so they're just, just a symbol, not String. And also, they do not keep any information <laughs> except for the symbol itself. So it's just it's like plus. Plus is just plus. It is not plus with a value. Like so next, for each token, 
So for literal, what happens for the literal? If we, if we take a literal, we have just copy it from the input stream of symbols into the output stream of uh, tokens. For um, literal, for tokens, we have to do something more clever. We have to take the string outside of this. We have, first, we have to see what the, what the, the pattern for this lit token. How, how can you define an integer? And second, you have to show how to extract the needed information, store it in, in this uh, object. So the object is called t-value. So for each, you will define this token like that. Here you will have that. If you, you try to parse it as an integer, if it, it's something bad, usually it's too large. So now, but what is the pattern? So here you see, here we have a string of symbol, which is actually a regular expression for integers. So, well, regular expressions, well, I hope that most of you know that. Regular expressions are a way of uh, writing down the patterns for uh, parts of your text. So just this example says, okay, backslash D is the shortcut for digit. So it's zero or one or two or et cetera, nine. And this plus says that you have one or more. So again, you can say something else. You can say like a letter and a letter or a digit with star. Star is the version of plus, which can, can be zero. This will be say something for identifiers. So again, well, this regular expressions, you can use arbitrary regular expressions here. And what happens now? So you define a function in Python. This is the body of the function. It will run when you in, when you involve it. But uh, this is the regular expression, which is actually an, just an object, just a string, just a value. What will Python do with this? Well, really nothing. It's just a comment. Just, just you, okay, you are define your function and you say, okay, it will include as the first line just an object, which what, what can you do with that? So Python will do nothing. But Lex will take this up and perform the following. So it will build a lexical analyzer which uh, takes uh, the input data and tries to find the longest string which is okay for some, um, for some of the regular expressions. But here is only one, this is this pattern. So it, if it finds a line of digits, it takes the longest uh, substring of digits and says that this is a number. When it finds this, when it gets, uh, gets started, it will uh, call this function and the function and put the value inside here. So this value is just this string, so it's a word. Now it just tries to transform into an integer. If it succeeds, then it returns an integer and you can use it. If it fails, well, it says too large because how can a string of digits be not an integer or fail to transform into an integer? It could be very long. So then we just say that this is, this is a fail. So if it finds up this, it will return this, uh, the same for other literals. And if it finds something else, it will return lexical error. I don't know, like a Cyrillic letter or a Latin letter, which is not X or something. So this is a regular expression. So this is a, another example, which is a regular expression for names. So you see here, it first should be a, a letter or the underscore, and then you have an arbitrary long string, maybe a zero, here's the cleanest star here, of letters or digits or underscore. And this will not use any uh, sub-program because it just returns the name, it just doesn't change the t-value. And finally, you build the lex, so you import the lexical analyzer and you run lex lex, it will implement your lexi automatically. So now parsing. So we implement this function for multi, so polynomials are kept in just as arrays of coefficients, of course, starting from the zeroth one, which is the free coefficient and going upwards. So it has a length, which is the degree of polynomial of plus one, because we have a free one and the back. And then you just have this, what they call safe add, well, this is all implemented in the, in the code. I won't. Uh, so safe add is for, it should, what, what, why it's called safe? Because this array is originally empty and you have to enlarge it when you add polynomials because when you multiply it, you will have bigger, bigger, bigger degrees and the degree is put here actually. This is the degree of the two, two polynomials there. And you return it. So the implementation of safe add is inside the code. I won't 
show it. It's not the interesting part. And the interesting part is here. So again, you define a function, which now is started with P, which is for parser. So P is uh, the P function. It includes the rule of your grammar written like this here. You see that this is exactly the rule of your grammar. So the only thing is that you, we wrote it in small letters, not in big, with capital one. And you say that, okay, if a term is a term multiplied by an expression, then you will just make a polynomial multiplication. So why P1 and P3? So you have to return your value in P0 that corresponds to this one. And now you have one, two, three, four. So P of two is meaningless. It's just the symbol for bracket. You don't need it. This is also, but for these two, you will have the objects which are polynomials and you can multiply. And the same goes for any of your objects. So for example, for, for just for X here, here, you will, what, what should you return? You should return this coefficient, which is a P1, inside the cell, which is called, so you have power opt. So you have to put it into element, which is this power. Or if there is no power, you have to use one. And another option, you can use just the integer, and you should put it into the, as a zeroth element of your array. So this just generates a monomial. Then you can take it as a term, you can multiply, which we did. When you do sum, you do the safe add. When you do minus, you should first put the minus before each coefficient and then do this, and do this, and stuff like that. This is all implemented code. So the P function generates, as I said, the object P0 using the P1, P2, which are obtained from recursive, from passing procedure. Yeah. Is that clear? So this is the crucial part of the process. Yeah, so uh, well, P0, you have an P0. argument, you have a parameter here, which is an array. Mm -hmm. And uh, this array, starting from element one, P1, P2, P3, mm -hmm. it is filled with the results of recursive procedure for these elements. Mm -hmm. So these, either they come from the lexemes, from the lexical analyze. So here it's a trivial, it just takes this symbol. But if there was num here, it will return this natural number with a t value. If it is a meta symbol, as they call so, which is going to be expanded further, mm -hmm. then uh, this is the result of the recursive call. So this is the p0 of this one. So now this is about p1, p2, p3. Mm -hmm. And the p0, it's actually empty at the beginning of this function. And it is the place where you should put the result of your parser. So it's. Um, just the detail of the implementation, so maybe it would be more natural just to, to return it, to say, okay, okay, and then return this. But they implemented it like that. So the zeroth one is the result, and all the others are the recursive uh, arguments. So this is how it should work. It's a, a bit counterintuitive, but I think this is for some efficiency reasons. Or maybe it got inherited from the C++ implementation. But this is how it works, quite usable. Okay, and finally, again, you should build the parser. So import this parsing library and you use yak yak, which uh, takes a uh, function yak from yak. And you will see the code. Well, it's, I use the old link with this 2019 here because it's already there. But if you remove 2019, you will see the new core, course page. And there you will find the same just in the tutorial item. So this example with a parsing, uh, Polynomials for simplifying polynomials will be published there, along with a big bundle of examples for PLY, which I took from some Argentinian guy who taught a course on that before. So if you, so I hope that this example with polynomials will be absolutely sufficient for your needs. But if not, then you can do there, or you can refer to the standard um, uh, books about uh, PLY, with the official documentation. So. In your tasks, the parsing will be not that hard because it's just parsing of expressions, as you see here in polynomials. So usually people use PLY for much harder things like parsing of files, like uh, XML style or probably matrix. So, um, okay. And uh, for priorities, how to postulate priorities. Again, I think in this task, again, it's a, at least in task two, you don't need this because you write your brackets officially, you don't need the priority. In the first task, you can use them if you wish. 
And uh, for priorities, see another example, which is the calculator. So this is exactly what you need. So in the priority, so there it says that multiplication has a bigger priority than, uh, say, addition. But beware, in the grammar, it's reversed. So in the grammar, the lower the priority of your operator is, the bigger the priority of your rule is. Because if you're, for example, here, if your operation has, so let's see it, let's see it here. Uh, so your multiplication operation has higher priority. Mm -hmm. This means that first you should parse this. Mm -hmm. And all, only then you should parse this. So your rule for plus has bigger priority. It should be applied first. And then you apply multiplication rule. Mm -hmm. So here it is not implemented like that. Here it's implemented as uh, a bunch of different meta symbols. So this is not, this is an expression. This should be a term. So you cannot mm -hmm. parse this because this is not an, this is an expression, but not a term. But if you use priority, then you should reverse this. And also there is a way of doing association. So this will be helpful for impl implication. For disjunction, you should also postulate this because if you don't do this, uh, your parser will return you, well, actually not an error, but a warning. But uh, so it will say, okay, I chose some random parsing, but it's bad because there's another one. So it's the same, but you don't know. This. Okay. So, um, and now the official formulation of the task, it will be a bit longer because it includes all the uh, syntactic uh, definitions. So you have a Boolean, in the first task, you have a Boolean formula, you have a set of variables. So what to use for variables, it's on your choice. You can either use a fixed set of variables like PQR, mm -hmm. or you can implement this lexical uh, analyzer for identifier, which says that uh, your variable can be something like, I don't know, PQ123 or something like that. So the, actually this doesn't matter much. Now you will, so in, in my tests, I will use variables PQR. So please make these legal variables just for, for me to run the test properly. So this is conjunction written like that, disjunction written like that, implication written like that, negation written as the tiled. So this is arbitrary choice. Again, please don't alter this just for the tests run properly. So you can make your, uh, software look more modern and Unicode if you add also the Unicode here as alternative ways of describing that, but it's for your choice. And now we have translated into CNF and DNF. And again, the results should be returned as the same form of formula. So again, it should be written like say in DNF, it should not be just an array of arrays and some square brackets, it should be disjunctions inside conjunction, literals inside using negation written like that. So just in order to this work. So this is the first task. Um, again, there are no constants, no zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. So you can, you will maybe encounter problems with, uh, say, uh, CNFs and DNFs, which are always true, always false. So this should be handled as a special case. In this case, you should just um, write, um, something like P and not P or P or not P. So this is a substitute for uh, constant false and constant, constant true if you don't have them in the language. So please be aware if you have this. So, um, or, or you can say that it's just empty, but uh, an empty thing is not a formula for this. So you, know, you have an empty disjunction. What does, it, what does an empty disjunction mean? It's false, right? Mm -hmm. But then you should make one just uh, falsifying clause, P and not P. So this is meaningless, you can always remove it, but it is the only one that goes. The same, so the second is the Boolean formula in 2CNF. So, uh, well, as you know, a 2CNF is a conjunctive normal form in which each uh, clause includes not more than two literals. So here you, ah, yeah, so there they should be one of the forms. Actually, this is, not the complete description. So it can be either this, it's a disjunction of literals, or this is an extension, a syntactic sugar. Uh, people like implications. Moreover, people like implications more than uh, disjunctions, usually. So we're also allowed to do implication. Implication is not alpha or beta, so it's actually the same to, to close. And also, we'll, I will put it on the web page officially. Please uh, allow one element clauses. So you can also have clauses just with one literal. P, or maybe not, not Q. So 
alpha and beta here are literals, so they can be variables or their negation, so a p is a variable, and the CNF is presented in its usual notation like that. So you can always suppose that the brackets are in their places. No, uh, no hunt for um, priorities or associations. Okay, so these are going to be two tasks. So the deadline will be roughly in uh, two weeks. I will, after the official deadline will be posted in the web page. So this will be a bit more than two weeks. I think. So the trick is that the next class and the class after the next one is still before the deadline. It will be, I don't know, the Friday after the class after the next one. The date, I don't remember it by now, go for the information. So you can submit it in any convenient form. So you can just send me the code by email or um, you can open a JIT repository and invite me to take the code from there or anything else like that. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't implement any sort of online grading system for that, but I will run the test just locally on the computer. So you can, yeah, you, as, as I said, you can use any programming language of your choice. So if you use something exotic, please write a comment on that. Um, you are encouraged to use parsing software like Lex and Yak. Again, well, formally, it's okay if you do it by hand, but don't blame me if you fail to do this. Uh, with Python, you can use either Python 2 or Python 3, if you wish. So, but again, if you use either of them, just please say which version of Python you're using, because they're incompatible and uh, just, just, just inform me. Uh, the difference is uh, actually not that significant, but you should. Okay. So good luck with this program assignment. So if you have any questions by now, please ask them. Uh, well, I suppose that there could be not so many questions now because well, we just started. Next time we could uh, spend some part of the lecture for also answering questions and discussion and the time after the next one, then will be the official deadline. Okay, so all this stuff will be published in the web page. So now I will stop uh, sharing my screen and I will rotate to the blackboard and switch that guy off. So, um, where is the marker? marker. And now I will um, change to the second part of the talk of the lecture today. So, unfortunately, the technical problem will be a bit shorter than I suppose, but I hope it will be okay. Uh, what are we going to discuss in the next several days? So, um, what what we started with? So, we started with satisfiability problems. So what is satisfiability? Uh, it's the problem whether a Boolean formula in a given form is um, satisfied. So we moved to CNF satisfiability. So CNF sat is a, a version of satisfiability question, which is um, uh, the same question for conjunctive normal forms. And actually, there are specific types of that. There was two sat, and there was three sat. And actually, you can do some k sat for an arbitrary natural number k. Okay, this means that your uh, uh, clauses are bounded in their length by this specific number k. Okay, so so far so good. So yeah, this k is a constant. It's just it doesn't depend on your input. And so the input is much longer than k. So for example, this is three, and the input CNF could be very large. So it has many clauses, but each clause can have a variable, but each clause is bound. And there is a very specific difference between two and three. So actually, this is in mathematics, it's what happens usually that you have a very big gap between two and three. So two-dimensional world is much easier than the three-dimensional world. So for two sat, we have a polynomial time. Time algorithm. I will just write poly L. So, well, we didn't formally define it, but uh, the intuition was that if you write your, say, resolution method, implement it as a computer program, then the running time of this program will be bounded by a polynomial of the um, uh, input size. So, the input size can be roughly measured as uh, the number of variables because the length of the whole uh, CN, two CNF is quadratic with respect to a number of variables because number of pairs is quadratic and well, you will have some a bit more, but it's just coefficient. So 
and he found it by a polynomial. I don't remember, maybe we even tried to compute his degree, but the degree of the polynomial heavily depends on our implementation, how we, how we really do that. So, for example, if we have, um, well, how do we implement these uh, clauses in the reasoning and stuff like that? So when you will, if one of you does this task, number two, you will see that you will have to make these choices. But this notion of polynomiality is very robust. So just looking at a sketch of the algorithm, you can understand whether it is polynomial or whether it is not polynomial. So just another quick example, if you have sorting of ordering of an array of some elements, maybe natural numbers or stuff like that. Well, most of you know some algorithms which are quadratic or even n logarithm n. So the quadratic algorithm is something like bubble sort, say heap sort, in a merge sort are truly n log n, but again, it depends on the implementation. You can immediately, you can, at some point, you can fail by just trying to copy the array each time, will, will make your algorithm n square log n or something like that. So, for what is called quick sort is only called quick, actually, it is n squared in the worst case. So, again, this polynomial bound should be in the worst case. So, uh, it's the, the complexity is measured as the maximal running time on the inputs of given length. So there could be easy cases, but in general, it could be hard. So a quick sort is uh, quadratic, but it's still polynomial. So it's still okay. And we say that the problem of, uh, well, it's not a decision problem, it's a function, but the question of sorting an array is polynomial decisive. But we can think about a stupid algorithm which just tries all the possible permutations of elements of the array and tries to find which one is the correct sorting. So the complexity will be something like n factorial multiplied by n, because you have to check, this is the checking that is sorted, this is the, this. And uh, this is not polynomial, it's more than exponential. So this is a very uh, easy to understand note. If you look at an algorithm, you, without its implementation, you, not always you can understand what is the concrete degree of the polynomial, which is the boundary for the length, for the running time, but as always you can understand what is the, whether it's polynomial or not. So this is polynomial. So what is going here? Uh, again, you can try to apply resolution. Uh, if uh, you do that, you can run into exponential blow up of your number of clauses. So this was an exercise on a practical class. In my group, we didn't present a solution. We'll do it today. I think in another group, I don't know, but technically the answer is that you can have exponential blow up. If you have three sets. Why does it happen? Well, naturally, because uh, if you do a resolution for two, three clauses, say you have P or Q or R, and you have not R or not S or T, something like that, when you resolve, you will get P or Q or not S or T. This is a four clause. You can have five, six, seven, so you will have the exponential number of possibilities. And you can find a formal example of that. So this means that resolution, when applied here, doesn't give you anything good. So the resolution method um, doesn't, uh, is not polynomial. So this means that it's practically a bit like useless because if you uh, try to implement uh, not resolution, but uh, just brute force search of two tables, you would get it roughly the same efficiency. You also have to find not n is the number of variables and you will have to try two power of n possibilities and at each one you should compute your state f which is polynomial so you have a polynomial multiplied by two to the power of n also exponential. And uh, you can ask well maybe you could implement something more clever for this three set and maybe you could do it polynomial time. And uh, it would be nice to answer that, well, guys, it's impossible. And uh, you cannot do this due to theoretical reasons, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, by the state of art, well, I don't know by yesterday evening, I just checked in the morning, this is unknown. So you cannot uh, say that your uh, polynomial is, uh, that your three set problem is not polynomial. This is impossible to, to, to uh, say it like that because uh, people don't know. It's an open mathematical question.
whether there exists a polynomial uh, algorithm for it. But instead of this, people invented uh, a sort of substitute. They invented the theory of NP hardness and NP completeness. So there will be a class of uh, problems, which is called the NP class, which has two definitions, which we'll, I think, uh, formulate next time. And uh, the NP class, roughly speaking, includes uh, problems in which you can guess. So here you cannot, well, we don't know how to deterministically and efficiently uh, find the uh, uh, satisfied assignment. But if you um, uh, get this assignment, if you manage to get to guess it, then checking that your guess is correct can be done polynomial very easily. If you are given the answer, you just substitute your variables in your formula and just quickly compute. It works for SAT. It works for SAT. So other examples of NP problems will include, for example, suppose you have a graph. Well, what is the graph? You have vertices and you have some edges. So is there a Hamiltonian cycle in the graph? So a cycle which takes it goes through each variable exactly one time, this sort of traveling salesman part. Mm -hmm. So Hamiltonian, we will we'll discuss it in, in the practical parts. Hamiltonian cycle. Now there exists one. Well, how to, how to find it? Well, very hard. Mm -hmm. But if you know a cycle and check it is Hamiltonian, it's mm -hmm. trivial. So you would say, for example, is there a cycle like this, like this? Like this, like this. Aha, this is not a cycle, but if you have also this edge, you will have it. So, this is the Hamiltonian cycle, just the outer one. Mm -hmm. So, if we know and we have guessed it somehow, then we just easily check it. So, this class of problems is called NP. Why NP? Well, it's called non deterministically polynomial. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about non determinism in the next lecture. So, this is called NP. And this is a big question whether P is equal to NP. So, uh, of course, if you have a problem which is just decidable polynomially, it's also in NP. Because if you are not allowed to guess, it's, it's weaker than if you are allowed to guess. But the question is whether this class is, contained, uh, is included in this. So, whether anything which can be done by guessing can be also done just by determining program. This is a hard question. Sometimes it happens that you can do this. And one of the such a problems is the parsing problem, by the way. Because what is the parsing? So you have, you have the grammar, and you have to construct the parsing tree. So again, it's trivially NP, because checking that you are, uh, so checking that your parsing tree is correct, it's of course polynomial. Yeah? Because just check that your parsing tree is constructed according to the rules of the grammar. But, uh, how to construct the parsing tree using your input data. It's not trivial. It involves specific lexical, oh, I'm sorry, syntactic analyzing algorithm, which I implemented in EAC, but it's doable. And it's polynomially decidable, and this is a classical result of the computer science. So sometimes you can avoid guessing, you can do without that, and you can just deterministically, as they say, using an algorithm, just find out the result. But for three sat, we don't know, for Hamiltonian cycle, we don't know, and there are many problems which we don't know. But this don't know is a weak statement. We have a stronger one, and the stronger statement says that um, these problems are so called NP hard. So the NP NP complete, there's a big difference between them and discuss this later. So what's the NP hard problem? So N, oh, NP complete. Okay, let's call it NP complete. So an NP-complete problem is a problem which is in NP itself and which is, in a sense, the, one of the hardest problems in the class. So uh, if you have an NP-hard problem and you somehow manage to solve it polynomially, that immediately will solve all other problems also in polynomial time. So all other NP problems are reducible to any NP-hard one. So any NP problem can be encoded as a three set instance. This is called the Cook Levin theorem. I will, I think, prove it maybe next time. 
Well, you, you actually give a sketch of it, just an idea. But the trick is that and be complete problems are the hardest problems in the class. So if you write it as a graph, you can write it like this. So here is polynomial. This is the whole is the NP, and here R and P complete. And if P is not equal to NP, the picture is as follows. So you have the easy problems here, you have the hard problems here. This set cannot intersect. Because if any of these problems has a polynomial solution, then everything else gets reduced to it, and all the problems in NP become polynomial or solved. Mm -hmm. So this is one sort of picture. The other one is that if P equals NP, then it's just one class. All problems are P, all problems are NP, and all problems are uh, NP hard in a sense, because everything is solved. Of course, this is not the whole picture of complexity world of uh, problems. There are problems which are harder than NP. There are unsolvable problems, for example. Existence of such problems is just by cardinality. I don't know that the, each problem is just a set of, it's a decision problem. You can just say it's a set of input words for which you have to answer yes. So there is a continuum of possible sets. And so this uh, continuum of possible decision problems and only a countable number of algorithms. So you have unsolvable problems. You also have problems which are not solvable in NP or NP spaces. But nevertheless. So, okay. And in order to continue, we have to discuss some uh, computation model. So, well, when we are talking about uh, a concrete problem, then you can just implement your algorithm in a programming language and say, okay, this is implementation, and this is how I calculate its efficiency. Of course, you can be asked what happens if you transmit it to another programming language, but you say, okay, for an amenity will survive, stuff like that. But when you are discussing NP completeness, we'll have to discuss the notion of arbitrary decision problems. So when we want to prove that this is, an, so what, what is the basic philosophy behind this? So we want to prove that this is NP part. Why? Why do we want this? Because people believe that P is not equal to NP. But otherwise, people tried hard to find out that uh, a polynomial solution for many NP hard problems, they always failed. And uh, therefore, they believe that P is not equal to NP. Thus, under the condition of P not equal to NP, we will have uh, the result that uh, an NP has complete problem has no polynomial time solution. So we will have, so here we have this question mark. We say that uh, this problem has, uh, we don't know whether it has a polynomial time solution, but we can say it's a bit weaker statement. We can say that if P is not equal to NP, this problem is not polynomially solvable. Or by contraposition, if it is polynomially solvable, then P equals NP, which is highly unlikely. We don't say that this is not the case because we don't know this formally, but it's highly unlikely. Okay, so uh, this, is the pur this is the purpose of proving NP hardness. But when we prove NP hardness, we need to construct a reduction from an arbitrary NP problem to this problem. And therefore, we need to discuss what is an NP problem in general. And first, we need to discuss what is a, an algorithm in general. And then, as computational model, we start with the very standard thing, which is the Turing machine. So, well, I think some of you know about Turing machines, some of you don't. So, just in the end of this lecture, we'll give a uh, small introduction into this and in practical class will have exercises. So a Turing machine is an abstract um, computational device which is very simple in its implementation mm -hmm. but which is as powerful as any possible computer. So the latter is called the Turing Church status and is not a mathematical theory. So uh, the you cannot prove this mathematically that your, um, say, real life computer uh, can, you can yeah, prove it for a concrete computer that it can be re implemented as a Turing machine. But um, would they hear about any computer in the world? We don't know. So maybe they could implement some physical objects, black boxes, which somehow compute functions which are not computable in Turing machines. So this is sort of. Um, 
This is a sort of philosophical conjecture, philosophical thesis. Now it's supposed to be one thing that uh, people agree about this. A funny thing is that uh, the Turing machine is actually more powerful than a usual computer. The <laughs> reason is that uh, in a Turing machine you have, say, really infinite memory. Well, this memory is not, of course, it's just at least it's potentially infinite. So at each step, there is only a finite number of elements in the memory stored. But you can make arbitrary many cells bytes of memory use. A real computer, well, in the theoretical model, it also has infinite memory, so you can allocate more than more objects, but physically it's not the case. And uh, physically, at some point, you will get out of memory. So this means that actually the computer is a finite automaton. It is a finite number of states because its memory is finite. The Turing machine is really genuinely infinite. So how can it be implemented? Well, suppose you have this infinite array, array of uh, hard drives where you can on the spot just uh, add new memory to your computer. Again, you, we don't speak about problems with indexing this memory and stuff like that and with uh, manufacturing these hard drives, but if it runs out of memory, it doesn't stop with an error, but it, it says, okay, give me more memory. This is how a Turing machine works. In the Turing machine, the memory is organized in a very simple way as a tape. So there are differences in the definitions, so the tape should be infinite. The tape is just uh, a line of cells. So I will look at the, um, at the practical uh, to today's practice uh, for this. Uh, how do I, we didn't define it here in any way. So there is, uh, it's just a line of cells. So it can be infinite in one direction uh, or it can be infinite in both directions. Um, so it can be organized as natural numbers. It can be organized as, uh, uh, integers. It's uh, both are okay. In each cell, you will have an element, well, which is an element of a special alphabet used in the Turing machine. So there is a cell alphabet called gamma, which is the cell or internal alphabet. It could be zeros and ones. It could be something more digits or something like that. It's a, just a finite, finite uh, set of possibilities for each cell. And there is, besides this uh, tape, which is the memory, we also have a finite, actually a finite automata, a finite controlling device. So the Turing machine, as they say, observes a cell. Inside the cell you will have, yeah, you also have the specific symbol, which is called length. So that mm, memory is infinite, but uh, a priori, all cells except for a finite number are filled with these blank symbols. So they're empty. Mm -hmm. you, 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 can, yeah, you can use different uh, notation for that. Some people use this big B, as we will do in the practical class. Some people use empty. It's just the notation for that would be like, it's just the notation for blank, so mm -hmm. it's something which is blank. You don't have anything. And the Turing machine observes one of the cells. And here you will have this controlling model. Inside you will have what they call the state. So along with the things you have on the tape, you also have something you can remember inside your controlling model. But this is just an element also of a finite set of states. So if you, this is the set of states. Okay, so far so good. So now we have a finite controlling model, which uh, includes a finite set of states. And uh, inside this, you will have um, this type. So uh, now, how does this machine operate? So it starts with the input word on the tape. You observe the first symbol of the word. If the tape is infinite, you will have blanks. 
If it's fine, if you will have just the stop here. Then uh, what happens next? Uh, it operates and it uh, instantiates some of the commands. So how can the command be opened? So you will start with the state P, you observe letter A, and next you go to state Q, write letter B, and now this is the D, where D is one of left, right, neutral. So you know your state, you know what you are looking at at the J, and uh, now what should you do? You um, change your state. Well, you can make the same state, but you can also change it. You rewrite the thing which you see on the tape. Again, you can keep it. And also, you perform a movement. You can choose that to stay in the same place. You can go left one step, you can go right one step. So your memory is organized well as in old computers. There were tapes which were like, I don't know, VHS tapes. There were tapes we called streamers. Tapes with data and uh, uh, access to the data was like in the Turing machine. You could just, when you were, wanted to access the data, you had to move step by step to the place where it's located. So data access here is very inconvenient, but nevertheless, this Turing machine is an abstract computational model and any program in any programming language can be implemented on a Turing machine. This is a Turing thesis and this is quite understandable because you have anything which, which you could possibly need. You have memory, you can store your data, and you have finite controlling model which operates. So, and moreover, this translation is polynomial. So it doesn't keep the degree of the polynomial, but it keeps the notion of polynomial. If you have polynomial algorithm, its implementation in the Turing machine is also polynomial. Now, the degree could grow. For example, there is an exercise which uh, I don't know where we, whether we'll do it, but it's a well-known question. For, suppose you have uh, a set of, well, you have a Turing machine, but it's extended, so it has not one tape, but say two tapes. It's more convenient. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You can actually implement this on one tape. Mm -hmm. How? Well, this is the question for you. You can just think about this. This is implementable. But if you do this, then you are uh, efficiency lowers down, and you will get a quadratic blow up of your running time. Why should you? Why does it happen? Just briefly, you have two tapes, and in each tape you will have your own uh, running head. You observe a specific symbol. What happens when you try to implement it on one tape? You, of course, you will have. So here we have symbol A, here we have symbol B. On one tape, you will just have a pair which will be a symbol in your new alphabet. So you implement two tapes on one, it's okay, you will keep all your data. But now when you want to operate, you can say this pointer, you have only one point. So uh, you will have to keep also the data about the second one. And if you want to use the second pointer, you will have to perform many steps. You will have to go to the place where this pointer was located, perform your operation, then go back. This is all, of course, doable by this finite controlling mechanism, but this means that each operation, one operation of your original Turing machine or the two tape machine, will be uh, will boil down into uh, many operations on the uh, new machine, which has only one tape. But how many? So this number of operations, which is used to emulate one operation originally, this number is bounded by the total length of your data in memory, because uh, all other symbols are blank, they could not be observed. Well, maybe only the, let's say, well, only the closest symbol can be observed, but, but what is the maximal possible length of your um, data in your memory? It's no more than the number of steps your Turing machine has performed, well, plus the number of the input. Mm -hmm. Because how can you populate a blank, uh, a blank cell with something meaningful? In order to do this, you have to perform a step. And each step can populate only one cell. So this means that the total number of cells you have used is bounded by the uh, number of steps you have performed, plus the number of the input data, which was originally there. This means that uh, you will have the time for 
on the one uh, uh, take machine is going to be bounded by what? It's going to be bounded by T2 multiplied by T2 plus the length of the input, which is four. So this is roughly speaking quadratic law. So if your T2 is bigger than, and this is just like something very, it's like two T2, so it's uh, T2 squared. So you see that when you make these transformations between different but relative computational models, uh, you will have um, uh, you keep polynomiality. So you can have the quadratic or cubic blow up, but not exponential. You don't have any problem. It's just a gist about it. So, and finally, so we have to finish the lecture now. Again, sorry for the technical delay. Um, let's discuss determinism. So this is very easy. Uh, the machine code is, well, it's not only for Turing machines, it's for any computational model, but for Turing machines, it's easy to define. It's called deterministic. In only, it's deterministic if we um, have always only one instruction to use. So this means that for given P and A, there is only one instruction of this form, or maybe zero. Sometimes the Turing machine could fail. It means that there is no instruction was given P and A, it got into bad situations, fail. Also, it could be a good say, failure if it reached a specific uh, finishing state. So if it doesn't have any move, then we say that it finished, and this is it returned the result. But there could not be two possible uh, moves from one P. So if you have this, so you have P A, and you can either do this, Or you can do this. Then this Turing machine is called non-deterministic. So you see that deterministic Turing machines, which always know what to do, they are a good computational model for real computers, right? What about non-deterministic Turing machines? Well, they are a theoretical model. And uh, there are many questions about that, starting from the question, what does it mean for such a machine to compute? So it could make an arbitrary choice here, and suppose at one path it computed something, and the other path it computed something else. What did the machine compute? Mm -hmm. So this is the first problem. The second problem is that we don't know how to implement it, because who made this choice? So this is an automatic choice. We, uh, it's, we didn't say that it should toss a coin, or it should ask a user for some device here, or maybe it should always choose the first one or some other going to be deterministic. So um, this is just a theoretical model. So it's a transformation system which implements some sort of operations, and uh, it works like that. But uh, we uh, actually do not know um, how to. Uh, use, but it will be actually convenient for defining the NP class, which we'll find out in the next class.